what would be uh, so, so the research paper that I, I grabbed procedure that I was supervising around uh, with was also included like a bunch of other like combinations of oxides. And they were like first, okay, well let's replace indium with aluminum make it cheaper. And uh, when they did that totally messed up like the nature of the it was like there was only like one or two pretty heavy concentrations of indiums where it still turned like somewhat blue. It was mm -hmm. actually more of like purple. And lower concentrations it just made like a rust red. And I think that's what happens like they actually very little concentration of oxides and very high concentration of silicon oxide and aluminum oxide, which made the glaze material. Uh, So yeah, the highest concentration is like eight percent, where it's like where it's painting it on the tiles. But some areas are thicker, you can see that it's definitely like the orange, it's like an ugly orange. Okay. Yet there's um, it's not the the glamorous part of science, but it's one that that I think. That at least it seems that way from people griping on the internet, um, that there's an increased um, awareness of and movement towards recognizing that negative results, which can just mean when nothing happens, like we expected this to happen and nothing happened, yeah. um, should be publicized more. Um, because one, that's how science works. It's not always eureka moments. And two, because you want to save somebody else from having to do the same thing you just did. If somebody else is working in a similar field and your paper is saying, hey, we tried putting in and blue in the glaze at this concentration and it did not work. If you could save somebody else the same trouble. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I agree with that. But those aren't the ones that get lots of clicks for the journals. So the journals don't like those as much. Um, but as open access journals become more of a thing, I think it might become more of a I mean, really, I think that there is, I think that there is a need to be more of a, like, almost like a, a lab group blog um, approach sometimes where it's like, okay, you know, do your weekly write up of what you did this week, even if it was negative results and put it out there for everybody to see. It might not be publicized. Um, you might not want to put everything in there because if you're, you know, for intellectual property reasons. What? It's almost in me now. Hey, Miranda. Hey, how are you? Good. <laughs> um, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> all right, I was going to do that for you, but you're on top of it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so let's go. I was just looking at the indium there just to re refresh how far down the periodic table it was. It makes sense that indium would be a little bit more reactive than the, than the aluminum, perhaps. Uh, but interesting. Yeah, the aluminum, or sorry, the, the aluminum would be more reactive to, than the indium. Yes, it doesn't necessarily, it will only like got up to that temperature and like went right down. Mm -hmm. So if it was only like that quick, you know, it's going to replace the indium. That's the yeah, you might be able to do something at a lower temperature, but you might also have to do something like where you fix the chromophore before you put a glaze on rather than um, in the glaze itself. But then again, I don't know ceramics that well, so <laughs> time to time to defer to Grace's expertise. Yeah. I think, you know, we're going to try lower temperatures and I'm going to try a formulation that has no. Yeah, that could work. My silicate's really. Nice and stable. Okay. All right. Um, random quiz question. I did get quizzes graded. Um, Hannah, were you feeling good about the um, D, D, E, and F on that on that one after we went through on the other day? A little bit better. All right. After break, we can revisit that. I don't have the quiz pulled up, but we can we can make sure you're feeling better about that um, after break. Um, and then Miranda had a question about. Taste. Oh, I'm not showing the. Okay. 
taste in chemical structures. Um, yes, and, that was me. Yeah, it's so this is a good question. Um, the actually the some of the earliest artificial sweeteners didn't share the same similar structure, but but you're correct. Most flavors that that taste similar have similar chemical structures. There are some exceptions to that. Um, I want to say that is it saccharin or aspartame? One of them is actually a um, a small polypeptide. It's like a tripeptide as aspartame. Um, that it does it basically works to make your um, your taste buds or your your receptor sites for sweet more efficient. It basically it's it's similar to the way that capsaicin um, makes your 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 um, receptors for heat overly sensitive, so you get false positives effectively. Um, and menthol does that for cold receptors. Aspartame does something similar for sweet receptors. So any small amount of sweetness that would normally be detected, the sensation is increased. I want to say like three hundred fold. Um, it's a it's a pretty big relationship because remember these are exponential relationships because these we're really talking about equilibrium relationships for most um most times we're talking about something docking with an enzyme um you got an enzyme um you got the enzyme plus the substrate in equilibrium with an enzyme substrate complex. Um, and that enzyme, so the way that receptor sites work is when that substrate, enzyme substrate complex is formed, it sends an electrical signal to your brain saying, hey, this tastes whatever. Um, and so if you, can, if you can change the efficiency of the equilibrium constant um, by making the binding more um, favorable than normal, Remember that that K equation is E to the minus delta G over RT. So it's an exponential relationship. So a small change in binding site efficiency has a pretty big change in the equilibrium constant. Um, and so we see that with a lot of artificial sweeteners where they just bind to those receptor sites just a little bit better. They don't all work by increasing the efficiency. Some of them actually do mimic the chemical structure um, and you see that a lot with the, what they call the sugar alcohols um, are basically they're detected as being 80 to 80 to 500 times more sweet than sugar. They still have calories in them, but you can use 500 times less to get the same effective amount of sweetness. So a lot of times when you see like um, low carb stuff like low carb energy drinks and stuff like that. Um, it's a sugar alcohol that just hits those receptor sites more effectively than sugar. So you need less of it. They're not really zero carb, but they can be close to it and still taste as sweet as something with 12 grams of sugar. In it. Um, and we do see the same thing. The other one that's really interesting is umami, um, which is you know, the, the flavor of being savory, you know, meaty, satisfying. Um, that is literally caused by MSG. Um, monosodium glutamate. The glutamate just happens to be an amino acid that our bodies use on a regular basis. And for whatever reason, it's, um, it's what our bodies detect as being like protein heavy is glutamate. Um, and so things that have a lot of glutamate in them taste, have that umami savory taste to them. Um, so soy sauce, um, meats, especially red meat, um, but it's literally just an amino acid. And so other things that that's, that's actually what they did. The reason the MSG got a bad name in the seventies, like eighties and early nineties in, in really cheap Chinese restaurants, basically what they were doing is they were just taking cornstarch and oil and a little bit of water and mixing them together to make like a noodley type of, of, you know, consistency and then just adding MSG to it because it made it taste more savory. Um, and so you could think that you were getting a balanced meal because the cornstarch is carbohydrates, add a little bit of oil to get to give you that fatty sensation and taste and add some MSG, but you didn't actually get any real protein. You just got one amino acid. 
but your body was, your tongue was fooled in thinking it was a complete meal. Um, and so that's why, you know, once that came out and, you know, MSG sort of got vilified, um, it's, uh, it's not very common anymore, which is why people, they advertise no MSG, but they're not really true because there's glutamate in all the meat. It's just no added MSG because it used to be that you could buy MSG and add it like a salt shaker. Um, to, to stuff to make it taste more satisfying, more savory. Um, but that's pretty uncommon these days. I still kind of want to, I've never actually tried that, just adding a little MSG to some rice or something like that. I, mean, I imagine it's kind of similar to the flavor packets in, uh, in ramen, in cheap ramen. Um, probably have a significant amount of, of MSG in them. Is there anything other than like pulling your body into like having a full meal that is? transmitter as well so there there are there are downsides to it but it's, it's a necessary nutrient um it seems kind of unfortunate that we just kind of vilified an entire season like that well because it's not supposed to be just added as a season it's the way that our bodies are designed to uptake it it's supposed to be as part of complete proteins um and so just adding it like that is a little bit like using artificial fertilizer, just adding ammonium phosphate or ammonium nitrate to soil instead of using manure that has all these biological components to it as well. So it's, it's a way to sort of bypass the entire system. Um, it's not to say that it's always harmful, but it definitely, if you overload your body with glutamate, it does affect things like learning um, and, and memory to some extent. Um, but it's, it's, an, it's not entirely clear exactly how, because those are such complicated pathways. It's not even dopamine's complicated, right? Dopamine's way simpler as far as its function goes, um, compared to, to glutamate and, you know, learning and memory. Um, so it's, it's probably best that it got at least toned back severely. Um, maybe probably not necessary for it to be vilified to the extent that it was, but you, know, you can't always control public perception as much as science might like to sometimes. All right, these are the last two that we ended with the other day. And so a reminder, the way these work, if we had a nitrogen-based nucleophile, if it was a primary amine, you wound up making that imine where you had a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon effectively in place of the carbonyl. And so in this case, we'd wind up making intermediate that looks that it was that carbonylamine. Basically, it was like the, the nitrogen version of an acetal. And again, we have another ring, ring closing here. So we want to be sure that we, um, that we draw the right number of components here. So the nitrogen is now part of the ring. So one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be a pentagon. And see if we can kind of keep everything more or less where it was. So I just rotate the nitrogen down, carbon two and three stay where they are. So 
So this is the one that I labeled two, three, four, and five. And the nitrogen was atom one. So that if you if you have them numbered like that, it allows you to go back through and add all the substituents in the right spot a little easier. Because and this is just step one, really, right? Because we need to it's the so the intermediate would look like this where you have the OH attached where the night to carbon five, and there was also a methyl attached. Then on carbon three was dimethyl as well. So our intermediate would look like that. And then the next step is kicks off the oxygen and you form a carbon nitrogen double bond. And so nothing really changes position once you do that. Getting the ring structure drawn for the intermediate is almost the trickiest part. Make sure you get everything in the right spot. But if you're careful and methodical about it, and again, it can be really helpful to have them numbered both when you're on the original molecule and on the part that you're drawing. Um, you, you should be able to do that without too much trouble. So then the next step would be nitrogen or the oxygen leaves. I'm not showing the proton transfer step, just showing the, the larger bonds breaking. Right, so the geometry looks a little bit wonky because I drew my pentagon funny. Um, but I think we can we can all see what's what it's supposed to look like at this point. Right, and so then that's the, the real trick is getting the ring structure drawn. And then of course remembering what the new functional group looks like, right? Especially when we're approaching it cold after a couple of days off one day off. And then remember, all of these are reversible. So if we took this and then exposed it to water, it would just go back the other way. You'd wind up with ring opening reaction, replacing that carbon nitrogen double bond with a carbon with a carbonyl again, and reprotonating the nitrogen. And so it's it means if you're if we're thinking about this the right way, we actually have twice as many reactions. We are, we get double the bang for our buck when it comes to memorizing these ones or remembering them, right? So you remember them forward. Just remember they can also happen backward, and you have a whole other set of reactions, like the one on the right hand side. So when you have a an acetal, so a ether a diether attached to the same carbon and you expose it to water, it'll turn back to being a carbonyl. So effectively, we're going to just chop those off, replace it with carbon oxygen um, double bond. And the piece that we chopped off just goes back to being a diol in this case, or it would be two alcohols if it was not a if they were not part of the same molecule. So our product here just looks like that. And so naming this, you could name this some this might be one case where the old school name style of naming um, ketones is um, easier because you we could name this cyclopentyl methyl ether or sorry cyclopentyl methyl ketone for our product. Otherwise, it would be something like cyclopentyl ethanone, which is a little bit weird because usually you can't have an ethanone because it's um, normally you need at least three carbons to have a ketone on you need three carbons in a row to have a ketone, right? So in this case, because the cyclopentyl group is the third carbon, 
it, it gets a little bit funky as far as that name goes. Um, so cyclopentyl methyl ketone, or you could name that cyclopentyl ethanol would work as well. You wouldn't even need to specify where the cyclopentyl group was because there's only one way you could draw cyclopentyl ethanol. Because if you put the cyclopentyl on the other carbon, it'd be cyclopentyl ethanol. Right? Because then you would have a, a carbonyl on a primary carbon. All right, questions on these two? Um, in addition, the same mechanisms, if we have nitrogen-based nucleophiles that look a little bit different, we can get a couple other, um, a couple other functional groups that look really similar to what we've already seen. Um, so if you take a carbonyl and you expose it to a nitrogen with an OH attached to it, which I'm blanking on the name of that molecule, hydroxylamine, okay, that makes sense. Um, so if you have hydroxylamine, then you can wind up making an oxime, oxime. If it's imine, then maybe it's oxime. I would normally say oxime, but potato, potato, literally. Um, so, and the oxymes aren't necessarily that remarkable on their own. There's a whole field of study dedicated to basically to every functional group is gonna have its own field of study, both in synthetic chemistry and in finding applications for these functional groups. Um, I don't know what oxymes are used for off the top of my head, but I do know hydrozones, which sounds like a bad guy from Captain America. Um, hydrozones are useful mostly because we can take a hydrozone and we can actually completely reduce it all the way to an alkane. So by converting a carbonyl to a hydrozone, it gives us the ability to totally remove the oxygen. It's one extra step, but that's a pretty powerful tool because up to this point, all of our reductions of oxygens had to stop at the alcohol. So the fact that we can now, this gives us the ability to go all the way to an alkane is pretty powerful. Um, and that, that reaction is called the Wolf-Kishner reaction. Um, and that, sorry, that, and that's specifically talking about the reduction of the hydrozone, right? So converting a ketone to a hydrozone just requires exposing it to, it's not azide, it's the di nitrogen nitrogen compounds, N2H4, hydrazine maybe, is that hydrazine? So if you expose a ketone or an alkyl to hydrazine, you make a hydrozone, which makes sense because if you take a hydrozone and you make it out like a ketone, let's just take hydrazine, add own to the end of it. Um, and then from there, just exposing it to really common molecules um, like potassium, potassium hydroxide water, sodium hydroxide water, and a little bit of heat, and you wind up producing nitrogen gas and um, adding hydrogens to the carbon. So you wind up fully reducing, the, you wind up oxidizing the nitrogen and reducing the carbon all the way to the alkane. Um, and just a, an aside, Hydrazine actually gets used in a lot of applications, especially in um, space-based applications. It's really common in space-based applications because it's a really convenient way of producing um, important building molecules like hydrogen gas um, and nitrogen gas. So it gets used as a propellant, but it also gets used as a feedstock in, in areas where you have very limited amounts of storage space 
um, because it allows you to make some of these really important small molecules pretty easily. I believe that hydrazine is what, um, what's his name from the Martian used to make his water for to grow his potatoes on Mars. Um, he took the, he took the hydrazine that was supposed to be a fuel source and effectively burned it in his breathing oxygen as a way to make water, if I'm remembering that right. And he got the chemistry more or less right on that. Um, the specifics of the, the actual plot line got punched up a little bit, but the chemistry is right. Um, it basically, though, if there was ever an explosion, the whole thing would be gone, not just like, you know, badly injured. Um, as I recall, the plot had it going. Um, overall, scientifically, that movie was pretty spot on. It's, I need to go back and rewatch that or reread the book. The book is pretty good too. And it's also, you know, it's a, uh, an example of the peer review process as well, because it was originally published as a blog. Um, and, uh, and he started getting feedback from and it, who the, the writer, I can't remember his name, um, was, a, was an engineer and he had this blog that a lot of other engineers and scientists read regularly. And so when he was publishing this story, the engineers and scientists in specific areas would chime in and be like, you totally screwed that up, fix that. And he would go back and fix it. And so it was a collaborative process where he was getting feedback from experts in all these different areas, which is why it's, the science is pretty accurate. Yeah. John dies at the end. It's also great. Oh, okay. I did not know that. It's like cracked comment section. <laughs> so it was it was more instead of making it more realistic, it was exercise and making it less realistic. <laughs> um, so all of these functional groups that we've been talking about, so acetals, imines, enamines, and to a lesser extent, the oxymes and, and hydrosomes um, can all go through reversible reactions. And what all of the reversible reactions have in common is this plus H2O. It's the common, um, the common reactant there. So basically, it's similar to being a hydration reaction. So, but a hydration reaction was for it was an addition reaction where you added a whole water molecule. In this place, we're using water to split a molecule apart. So it's a very, it's a subtle difference, but it makes what's called a hydrolysis reaction. So hydro from water and lysis means splitting. So basically you're using water to split the original molecule apart when you do this in the, in the reverse reaction. Um, you could think of all of the forward reactions as being dehydration reactions because they all produce a water molecule. And the reverse reactions would all be hydrolysis reactions. Um, and again, then that term gets used all the time in biology as well, um, because we're making acetals and hemiacetals all the time when we're making these polymers out of, of carbohydrates, right? Um, and so adding water to split cellulose into a bunch of glucose molecules is a hydrolysis reaction as well. Um, so all of those reactions where you break down starches, where you break down um, like our glycogen and stuff like that. They're all hydrolysis reactions because it's all fits under the same broad category. So let's do some more practice. Like I said, this, these mechanisms are also similar. So all the, all that's left to do is just to refine the, the subtle differences and get, get some practice with these. Do, do A and C first, and I'll put B and D on, on the next slide here.
It's interesting. There's two that I didn't even know were there. Add those ones in here too. Bonus practice that I didn't even know was there. All right, so for A and C, A is going to be a hydrolysis reaction. So we're starting from the acetal. So very similar to the one that we just did a few minutes ago. And that result is we're going to break the, di the um, diol off. And so we'll wind up with one, three propane diol as one of our products. And the other product is cyclopentana. The nice thing about these reverse reactions is they're always going to the same place. For this, for this chapter right now, all these hydrolysis reactions, the end result is turn it back into a carbonyl. It's just a matter of recognizing that it's a hydrolysis reaction and what the other product would be. If we add hydrazine to a ketone and remove water, so they do the dehydration reaction, the first intermediate is going to look like this. And the second step is add hydroxide water and heat. That's our, our wolf kirschner re reduction. And so the end result is That molecule. Going to add. You can draw the uh, the two new hydrogens on just to maybe get explicitly clear what's going on. But we don't really need to. Our end result, is the skeletal structure, is that methyl two methyl one cycle pencil propane or isobutyl. Cyclopentane. Do the parentheses because that's that's way more effective. To be something cyclopentane. And so it's going to be two methyl propyl. Cyclopentane and a two methyl propyl group is isobutyl group. So you could name this isobutyl cyclopentane if we're the one with so inclined. The only way I can keep that straight is because I know it's not T butyl and I know it's not sec butyl and I know it's not N butyl. And there's only other one other way you can draw a butyl group. So it's got to be this one. All right, so for these other reactions here, sometimes the hydrolysis reactions mean we wind up um, undoing a ring closing reaction. We have a ring opening reaction that we'll see on D, but let's do B first.
There's the other bonus reaction. So we did we did this bottom one a second ago. We'll go back and do the other one just for more practice here in a minute. So as soon as we recognize we have an I mean here, we're adding adding water. The H3O plus part is just we need an acid catalyst, we need enough protons around so, so that we can do all the proton transfer steps. And it's and in, in the case of the hydrolysis reactions, it has the added benefit of protonating the amine once you finish the hydrolysis, which further drives the reaction towards completion. It's effectively removing product by protonating it because it's no longer the same compound once you protonate it, right? And so it adds one more layer of, um, of equilibrium that we can lean on um, by, by protonating that nitrogen. So we get even more complete reaction in the hydrolysis reaction by just making it extra acidic. So we're going to be chopping that section off. And remember the, the starting point to make the imines was, um, was just a primary nitrogen, was a primary amine, right? So we're just replacing those, those two bonds that I, that I crossed out with hydrogens effectively on the nitrogen. So we're just gonna make methyl amine And I will say methylamine always makes me think of Breaking Bad. I just respect the fact that they dedicated a whole season to finding a precursor. Um, and it's a really common precursor in chemistry. It's a reason that's actually accurate. They would have a whole tanker car on a rail, railroad um, just filled with methylamine because you use it to make everything. Um, so in this case, we make methylamine as our product. And then we're replacing that just with another carbonyl. So in the interest of putting all the carbons back where they, where they were, we could draw it this way, we could flatten it out if we wanted and make it, um, it would just be two pentanone would be the product there. And then D, Did buy this really cheap stylus two and a half years ago now. All right, so for D, it's a little bit trickier because we're not just going to slice through where the pi bond is this time. Because this is an enamine, we're not going to break apart the carbon carbon sigma bond. We're breaking off the nitrogen again. We're breaking the pi bond for the carbon. So we're not actually going to break this all the way off. We're going to break that nitrogen off and break. Pi bond there. So we're still going to wind up with something that's um, similar structure as norbornane, but with a ketone where the nitrogen is. These, the enamine hydrolysis is probably the trickiest because it's not just a matter of find the pi bond and chop it in half and add a carbonyl. I even said that when I said it was going to be a ring opening reaction, and I was wrong, right? That's yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll wind up with dimethylamine CH3, 2, and H. And
some some form of Norbor known. Um, and there would be some, when you have molecules with a common name, especially with complicated structure, there's a there's typically a numbering system that's already included in it. So with just we would need a number, but I don't remember this one off the top of my head. Um, so we would just it would be I want to say that carbon seven is the bridging carbon. And carbon one is one of the is would be this carbon or the carbon in front. So I want to say that this is too normal known, but I don't know that. There's some arbitrary numbering system though. Okay. Yeah. And actually, and now this is really making me feel like I can't even remember naphthalene's arbitrary name numbering system. And I worked 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 with that one for a really long time. Naphthalene's really weird because they don't number the carbons in the middle. I think because naphthalene looks like two benzene rings fused. And I want to say that this is carbon one and this is carbon eight, and nine and ten are the ones in the middle. Um, because you never use them, you can't attach anything to them, so you just don't count them. Um, and there's something weird like that. I don't remember exactly what it is, though. And I should, because I work with naphthalene. I, I used to be able to distinguish by scent whether it was 2,5-dimethoxynaphthalene two, two or 2,7-dimethoxynaphthalene. Um, or whether we had dichloronaphthalene apart from dibromonaphthalene. But that was all a long time ago. Now that all just smells like mothballs. All right, let's, is this one worth? This one's tricky. Let's do C here. It's not actually that tricky once you see it. <clears throat> it's really straightforward once you see it. It's one of those things that takes a second. That's the part. I was like, wait a second, do we know this reaction? That's your acetal right there, not on the big molecule. So we're gonna make formaldehyde and some more complicated diol. So it's just, it's a little bit backwards from the other ones where the acetal was on the big complicated side and we get a simpler diol. In this case, the diol is a bigger complicated molecule and the acetal is gonna make a simple molecule. Or sorry, the aldehyde is on the simple molecule. The other side would be so two four dimethyl two four pentane diol and formaldehyde. So again, recognizing where the acetal is was the only tricky part there. Once you see that, it's pretty straightforward. Here's a ring opening reaction on F. Let's do F first. This is actually more straightforward. And then we'll talk about E. So for 
f, start by finding the carbon that's a, that's one of our functional groups that we can idolize. So that's our acetal carbon. So we're going to break the two carbon oxygen bonds and replace it with replace them with a um, carbonyl group. So this is going to be tricky to draw unfolded. And again, it, could, it might be helpful to draw it with everything in the same spot first. That looks really weird now, but now we can see where all the bonds need to be and we can unfold it. So if we consider that the aldehyde that we made has to be carbon one, two, three, and then symmetrical both directions now. So pick one. So it's four carbons. It's our longest continuous carbon chain that starts with the aldehyde. So one, two, three, four. There's my aldehyde group. On carbon four, there's an OH. So now we drew everything on the right side of the molecule. We just need to add the other branch on carbon three, so carbon one, two, three, and it's add one carbon and one OH. And that would get really messy to name it. I had, because now we've got the aldehyde still have precedence, or is it the diol? Is the diol the fact that there's two of them take over? It's probably still the aldehyde with preference, with uh, priority. So we name it as a hydroxy aldehyde, but then we also have a complicated branch that is a hydroxy methyl. So if this molecule doesn't have a common name, it would be something like the IUPAC name would be something like. 4 hydroxy 3 parentheses hydroxy methyl close parentheses butanol. And we haven't messed around much with using hydroxy as a prefix. So all right. Let's do E and then we'll take our break. So questions on that one? Makes sense when I unfold it, right? But yeah. doing it yourself with a blank piece of paper is the trickiest. Don't be afraid to just number it and draw it in an ugly way where you know the bonds are all right. So it's extra work, takes extra time to draw it. If you're gonna redraw your product twice, but if you can be sure that you didn't lose a carbon, and that that's gonna allow you to put all of your groups in the right spot, that's fine. We wouldn't typically want to leave it the way I had it drawn in red as your product because that's that's really ugly for no reason, right? That's, and not for no reason, it's so that you don't have to redraw it, but it'd be a, a fairly non-standard way of drawing this. So we want it to be drawn in a way that somebody, to make it easier on our readers. So what do we have going on for E? I guess maybe we call this a diene amine. So maybe with diene in parentheses and amine coming after because the ene part is di, but not the amine. 
So I would take this one step at a time, ignore one of the double bonds and just treat it like we're like one of the enamine reactions that we did before. So pick one of these. I'm just going to say that one is the carbon nitrogen bond we're going to break first and redraw the product and see what we get. And so you can actually clear all of this. So we're going to wind up with six carbons and then a nitrogen. And we're undoing the double bond as well. So we're going to wind up with one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. There's our nitrogen. There's a methyl attached to our nitrogen. And there's still a double bond on one side. And where the nitrogen was attached to carbon one is now a, an aldehyde. And again, if you redrew it still in that somewhat cyclic structure, but with everything broken apart, that's not a bad approach. Just since this is a just a regular ring, it's not too tricky. But you still might want to add your numbering for the sake of, of drawing everything out. And remember that that bond that we broke between the nitrogen and the carbon is the one that's being replaced with the carbonyl. The sigma bond that we broke is where the carbonyl grows. Once we get here, we still have an enamine. It's a little bit of a weird enamine because we're used to our enamines have needing to be secondary amines. And that's why they need the enamines in the first place, right? Otherwise, it would just stop at the um, imine. But it's still an enamine, which means it'll still go through a hydrolysis reaction. So the next step is going to be to do the same thing again. We're just going to chop that bond off. Again, wind up with um, we'll wind up with methylamine. And where I use the red line to break that nitrogen off, we're adding in another carbonyl. So make sure you double check your counting. One, two, three, four, five, six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And we get hexane diol. Fun fact about dialdehydes. I'm a I'm going from memory here, but I'm about 90% certain that that's where dial soap gets its name. It's an antimicrobial agent because it's a dialdehyde. So they just named it dial. I don't think it's still a dialdehyde though, because those aren't particularly good for you. But then again, benzaldehyde is is almond extract. That's perfectly fine. So the right dialdehyde is probably fine. What would you call the Higgin dial? What? Dialysis. Dialysis. <laughs> All right. Okay. I I told my one of my worst chemistry jokes to my gen chem class yesterday. So we're talking about molecular formulas, or not gen chem, intro to gen chem. Um, talk about molecular formulas, compounds versus mixtures. Talk about H2O versus H2O2. So water versus hydrogen peroxide. Reminded me of the old chemistry joke. Two chemists walk into a bar. Um, the first one says, I'll have H2O, please. The second one says, I'll have H2O2. The bartender says, I'm not going to serve you, but you're going to kill yourself. Something along those lines. I need to work on the, on the ending. I don't remember exactly how it goes. It's usually told us in the end. I've heard it like 
told a different way where um, the second one says, I'll, I'll have H2O also. And and the bartender is the chemist nemesis and says, oh, darn, you didn't say H2O. <laughs> Um, it, it, uh, the two, two people walk into a bar for my, the, my favorite one of those is a math joke, actually. It's, um, an infinite group of mathematicians walk into a bar and the first one says, I'll have a beer. And the second one says, I'll have half a beer. And the third one says, I'll have a quarter of a beer. And the bartender pours two beers and says, you guys should know your limits. But, um, all right, let's take, take a break. On that note, and uh, we'll come back at uh, what time is it? Let's come back at ten after. Looks like it's pretty close to nine straight up. Yeah, ten after, and we'll practice some more. So you mentioned uh, what's the next? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Dylan, oxide. How are you pronouncing it? I say oxide. Okay. But I have I have limits to the consistency of pronunciation. Yeah. Um, really nice to crystallize. Okay. And it's uh it's just like forms. Yeah, and then so there, there's also uh, nitrile by the dehydration. No. And then the MI from that nitrile. Okay, so that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. MI. <laughs> yeah, making making organic molecules from from natural products just for the heck of it. Not everything has to have a practical application yet, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I think that's that's one of the ones we're gonna get into in a second. It's making cyanohydrates, which is the other way of referring to nitriles, right? Uh, um, well, nitriles is just a organic cyanide. So since that's Oh, so, uh, yeah, cyanohydrin has the OH attached to it. That's what it is. Um, yeah, we'll talk about those in a second because you can then take those. Um, once you make the nitrile, if you expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, you can make the amine. So you can make vanilla amine. I didn't have lithium aluminum hydride. <laughs> Probably for the best. Yeah. <laughs> Since I live in a uh, fire prone area. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nothing like burning down the whole town, you know. But I mean, vanilla is so cool. Okay. All
Yeah, I can't imagine that that's a that that's a pleasant smell. Um, I mean, you can say that about just about anything with the sulfur in it. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head that smells acceptable. Um, just in general, I guess methionine. I don't know that methionine smells bad. It can't smell that bad because it's present in small amounts in most, most meats and proteins. So methionine and cysteine have to at least be tolerable. Um, and so these, these are pretty straightforward. Just substitute in anything with the sulfur for um, for an oxygen. So instead of an acetal, you get a thioacetal. And instead of a cyclic acetal, you get a thi cyclic thioacetal. Um, where these really wind up being significant is the fact that um, thioacetals can also be reduced all the way to an alkane. So, and that's, that's used with this, this um, catalyst called rainy nickel. Um, it's just a, a particular treatment of nickel, like the, um, remember the poison catalyst that we used? I can't remember what that one was called off the top of my head. Poison cat. The poison cat, right? <laughs> um, but that, that one was also named after the chemist who, who discovered it first, rainy nickel. Oh, it was Lindler's catalyst. Lindler's, thank you. Lindler's catalyst was another example of a weird treated metal. Um, rainy nickel takes a thioacetal and reduces it all the way to the alkane. And if the thioacetal didn't smell bad, then the process of the reduction almost certainly does because you're making a bunch of organo sulfur compounds um, in the process here. Um, and so it's, and technically you'd also need a stoichiometric amount of hydrogen gas, I believe. Um, but it could be that the process of treating the rainy, making the rainy nickel gives it hydrogens that it can then give away to, to the compound because when you attach a, a hydrogen to a metal, you get a hydride, right? Because hydrogen is more electronegative. So the process of making the rainy nickel could involve, um, sometimes they use the phrase impregnating the surface with, with hydrides um, to basically preload it so you wouldn't actually need hydrogen gas specifically. But I believe that this is still one where you use hydrogen gas as your other reactant. It's just not commonly drawn. Um, so that's pretty helpful in that now we have several different ways that we can reduce a class two carbonyl all the way to the alkane. Um, we didn't actually, I'm not sure if we used the term or not, but the Clemenson reduction is when you had that benzylic um, carbonyl and you expose it to that zinc mercury alloy and HCl and you got, got the reduction all the way to the alkane. That one's very specific to only benzylic carbons. Um, so it's a little, and its yield is still not all that great. But then again, a lot of these reductions are not gonna have great yields overall um, because in general, fully reduced carbons aren't all that stable in, in systems where you also have oxygens around, right? Because if there's any oxygen gas around or any oxidizing agent, you're fighting against equilibrium in order to make these fully reduced carbons. So they typically don't have great yields. This 80 and 70% are some of the higher yields um, for, for reduction reactions. Um, and they also have, so they, they have varying conditions for them. So the reason that this is significant is because sometimes if we have other things attached that we don't want to fully reduce, we want to keep them in a particular form, choosing which of these three methods we use to reduce the carbonyl winds up being a really useful tool. 
So if we have other R groups that are stable in the acid, but not the base, we could use the Clemenson reduction. If we have R groups that are stable in the base, um, we can use the wolf kishner reaction. Um, and that one has good yield, applies to any carb class two carbonyl anywhere. Um, but you have to have R groups that aren't going to also react with a base. So you can't, can't have you know, a chloride, for instance, or a bromide is not, you wouldn't want to use the wolf kishner reaction if there was a, say, a bromine right here because you're also then going to be competing with the substitution reaction, right? So anytime you have a good leaving group, you don't really want to have another nucleophile around if you can avoid it. So the, the desulfuration, de desulfurization, desulfurization um, is one that's lower yield, but it's under acidic conditions. So you don't have a nucleophile competing for anything. So if you have other R groups that are good leaving groups, you probably would have to use the desulfurization and sort of a last ditch effort. If you can't use the Clemenson reduction because it's not on a benzylic carbon and you can't use Wolf Kishner because your other R groups would react, then you go to desulfurization. And typically, we very rarely would you actually see it stop at the thioacetal. Like occasionally, for a test on this chapter, you might have it stop at a thioacetal. But in general, the, the reason to make a thioacetal is so that you could follow it up with, with the um, rainy nickel treatment, which that one is the one that doesn't. It's, that's the one reaction in this chapter that doesn't have a name. Um, associated with it. It's just desulfurization. Um, we're going to add a few more named reactions here in a minute. Uh, quick recap of hydrogen nucleophiles and carbon nucleophiles. We've seen these before. Their behavior is the same as any other nucleophile. It's just a hydrogen is a nucleophile. So we have a nucleophilic addition reaction, and we even saw this exact mechanism that we first learned about making alcohols, right? So hydride attack, followed by protonating that the resulting oxygen. So we need to spend any more time on this? Is this, this looks familiar enough probably. And anytime we start talking about hydrogen nucleophiles, the next slide is almost always Carbon nucleophiles, the two most common ways to, the most common way to make a carbon nucleophile is to do a Grignard reagent, which we have firsthand experience with now. Um, of course, we used it, we used it to produce a ketone, wouldn't we did? We, no, we used it to use CO2 as our nucleophile our, for the second step, or for our electrophile, CO2 for our electrophile. And the Arguinier reagent is the nucleophile um, to make benzoic acid. The, the, I don't have the mechanism pulled out, but it's going to look identical to the, the hydride one, right? It's just so the carbon wind up with that bond coming in and attacking the group, then protonate. Right. And the fact that we're starting from planar molecule means if we make something that has stereochemistry, we should get the racemic mixture unless there's some other um, sterics involved. One case that I could think of might be if you had cis dimethylhexanone, cyclohexanone. or even bigger branches like that, then just pure sterics is going to favor the, your new carbon coming in and attacking from behind. So you'd still get a mixture of both of them, but it wouldn't be a 50-50 mixture. It'd be some um, 
fixed mixture where you favored adding the new methyl group on the trans side of the ring, um, but still had some where it was cis, 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 trimethyl. So let's add another carbon nucleophile that showed up back in substitution reactions, but then we kind of left it alone for a long time. Um, cyanide is a good nucleophile. And cyanide as a nucleophile is useful in that if we think of that, of that cyanide group with just as a polyatomic ion, it's not all that obvious why that's different, except for once you add it and actually draw the structure, it allows us to add a carbon and a nitrogen. So this is a way we can add just a single carbon to this system pretty, pretty easily. Um, before, the way we would have to add a single carbon would have been something like add an acetylide and then go through ozonolysis. Ozonolysis isn't a super useful reaction, right? Because you have to bubble ozone into a solution. It's the practical limitations of ozonolysis are such that um, it's not all that helpful sometimes. So in this case, when we have cyanide acting as a nucleophile, we wind up with a cyanohydrin, which is just a, a cyano group or nitrile group attached to the same carbon as an OH. So just like enamine is two, um, two functional groups kind of combined together, a cyanohydrin is two functional groups combined together. It's a nitrile attached to the same carbon as OH. Um, and so it has characteristics of both of those functional groups. Most significantly, once we get to the, the cyano group being added, there are two further transformations we can make. If you take a cyano group and you expose it to lithium aluminum hydride, you fully reduce that carbon. And in doing so, you wind up making it an amine. On the other hand, if instead of doing it under basic conditions, under reducing conditions, if you do it, if you put this through a reaction with excess acid in the presence of water, you wind up basically knocking that nitrogen off and have it and um, replacing it, turning it into a carboxylic acid. So there's our way we can add just a single carbon. We add it as a cyanonitrile, cyanohydrin, um, and then reduce, oxidize it, excuse me, all the way make this and then from here you could take this and you could expose this to lithium aluminum hydride to turn it all the way into being a another alcohol attached there or you could stop at the class two carbonyl and then have it go through um, a wolf kishner reaction to reduce it all the way to being an alkane for instance right so we we're opening up a lot of possibilities between our different types of functional groups um, by having these these nitriles involved, um, as well as having those full reductions all the way to the alkane. That's a whole new realm we haven't really been touched yet. So let's do some practice. So if you start with a dithiol we get the sulfur equivalent of the acetal you get the thioacetal just double check how big your ring structure would be that gets attached
So three carbons in between the two sulfurs and we're, so that's five atoms plus the carbonyl carbon is the last piece of the ring. So we end up the six sided ring attached. go through step one here. You get a five-sided ring attached to five-sided cyclic thioacetal. Cyclic and cyclic is another one of those potato potato moments. But then we're going to follow it up with the rainy nickel. which is going to have the net result of get rid of all that sulfur. And this one, we actually had another option to get to the same point, right? Because that carbonyl is on a benzylic carbon, we could use that Clemenson reduction, probably get a better yield. And again, that Clemenson reduction was that from that was from the last chapter that zinc mercury alloy at HCl and heat, but it's specific to just the benzylic. Actually, I think two chapters ago now, in our first aromatic chapter. So pH, FGBR, phenyl magnesium bromide. That's a Grignard reagent, right? In fact, that's the one we made. So we're gonna have a benzene ring as our nucleophile attaching to the carbonyl carbon. and turn that carbonyl oxygen into an OH. So we get some, something that, and I guarantee this has a common name, but I, that name would be diphenylmethanol. If you replace the oxygen with the nitrogen, you make it an amine. I'm pretty sure, I always mix these two up. Is that diphenhydramine? That um, Benadryl, I think. Actually, uh, the diphenyl methyl is it's, it's like a diphenyl methyl ether substitute. Another thing like methyl groups. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the yeah, Benadryl is something that's got two phenyl groups in it and a nitrogen in the middle, then there's there's one that's just nitrogen di diphenylamine is a different pharmaceutical compound. Diphenhydramine is a little different. I always mix those two up because they both look very similar. All right, and on the right hand side, we just have a, at the top, we just have a quick reduction to the primary alcohol. So we wind up just putting a hydride on the carbonyl carbon, turning that oxygen to a OH. And if we we 
look at the second reaction here. This, this first step is another example of a reaction that has a pH sweet spot because our nucleophile is the cyanide ion, right? And so we don't want our, we don't want to use just cyanic acid because then if our nucleophile is protonated, it's not a very good nucleophile. Just like we did with the ammonia, right? The ammonia where we're using the nitrogen as our nucleophile, we had to be careful not to get it too acidic or we wouldn't have enough of our free nucleophile around. Same with the, the hydrocyanic acid. We, so you typically, you see both of these because you need it kind of buffered at the right pH. Otherwise you don't have enough free cyano groups around to actually see the reaction happen. And you see that a lot. Anytime you've got a mixture of an acid and its conjugate base, it's probably because there, you need the conjugate base to be a nucleophile, but you also need it in acidic conditions to have the right proton transfers happen at the right time. So anytime you see like ETOH slash NaOET, sodium ethoxide, that means that you need it to be under the right conditions. You need some protons around, but not too many protons around. Probably because the ethoxide is particularly mild. All right, so for this middle one, we'd start by attaching the cyano group to the carbonyl carbon, make the cyanohydrin. Another methyl group over there. I should be a little bit more careful before I add this. Or was it the aldehyde? This is a. Uh, One more. Okay. So then the next step was expose it to lithium aluminum hydride. So we're not going to oxidize that carbon and take it to the carboxylic acid we're going to reduce everything. So we're gonna take it to being the amine. The OH stays where it was. That carbon just becomes a, a regular alkane carbon. The nitrogen just takes two hydrogens. Those other ones stay where they were. It's easy to see when we get into chapters like this why a lot of people, especially in no offense, Miranda, this gets directed a lot at, at pre med students. When you get hit with chapters like this in OCHEM 1, um, every OCHEM gets a reputation as being this, this impossible to understand class that's heavily reliant on just memorizing stuff. When really all of these mechanisms make sense, but there's so many of them sometimes that it's easy to fall into. Well, I don't understand any of the mechanisms, so I'm just going to memorize things, um, which is really hard to do. But if that's the approach you take, and that's the old school way of teaching OCHEM too, um, Okay, sorry, teaching OCHEM as well was the was basically dump a whole bunch of reactions and mechanisms on people, see what they remember on the test, um, as opposed to getting a good fundamental understanding of what's happening and then piling them on. Um, so, and especially if chemistry is not your strong point, if you're taking OCHEM and thinking of it as something as a hoop you have to get through to get to med school or vet school or you know whatever program you're trying to get into, um, it's really, really easy to get in over your head because you, 
I couldn't just memorize all this stuff if I was trying to memorize. I need the mechanisms to be able to remember this stuff. Um, so it's uh, that's kind of where OCHEM's reputation comes from. On this last one, it's another cyano addition, except we're following it up with the acidic conditions. So instead of turning it into an amine at the end, we're gonna get rid of the nitrogen and turn it into a carboxylic acid. So we're gonna add one carbon where the aldehyde was, and then turn that one carbon into a carboxylic acid. So our final product look like this. All right, here's the last mechanism for this chapter, and it's a doozy. Um, it's a cyclo addition with carbonyls involved. So remember, cyclo addition steals all the reaction. Um, and it's called the Wittig re reagent, Wittig reaction. Um, it's the, the German, where you pronounce a W with a V, or is that Russian? I can't remember. Um, German. So, Wittig reaction is effectively you replace a carbonyl group, you replace the oxygen with a carbon carbon pi bond. So, this is another way we have of adding carbons to our carbon structure or to our carbon skeleton. Um, and it makes use of this, this weird molecule called a Wittig reagent. So, it's triphenylphosphorus attached to a carbon. The carbon that it's attached to winds up having um, an, a lone pair in one of the resonance structures. And so that means it, it makes a pretty good nucleophile. And the, the extra push here that takes it all the way from being just a, a, some, a nucleophilic addition to being to making the, the alkene is the fact that a phosphorus oxygen bond is really favorable. So you wind up basically swapping the um, carbon phosphorus bond for a phosphorus oxygen bond is the net result here. I'm trying to think of where else, I was like with the, with the hydroboration oxidation, we started with borane and then we made the carbon boron bonds because those were more favorable. And then we made the boron oxygen bonds because those were more favorable. And then we were, and then we were able to pull off the, um, the boron from the final product. And so this is similar in that it's going to have a couple of steps. Um, and once you know what you're looking for, it's pretty obvious. Anytime you see this triphenylphosphorus, it's going to be a bit of a reaction. And so it works. The mechanism for it is, is a two-step mechanism, but both of, the mechani both of the steps are kind of tricky because it's a two plus two cycloaddition. So remember with cycloaddition, that two plus two means two electrons from one molecule and two electrons from the other molecule reacts. So Diels Alder was a four plus two cycle addition because you had four electrons reacting on one side and only two electrons on the other. The Wittig reaction is a two plus two cycle addition and you make this four sided ring intermediate that's pretty unstable and then immediately fragments, which is Essentially, it's kind of like leaving group leaves or a rearrangement happening at the same time. It's basically undoing a cyclo addition, but it does it at the same time. Um, and the one of the ways you can understand this is um, it's like one of those old timey dances where 
people are doing a waltz and then they do a fancy step and then the, both partners switch. So you started with carbon phosphorus bonds and a carbon and a carbonyl and you do a quick two step and you wind up with carbon carbon bonds and phosphorus oxygen bonds. And so the, and the cyclo addition just looks like, well, if there's a positive charge on that phosphorus, the oxygen has electrons. So you break the carbon, the carbon oxygen pi bond to make an oxygen phosphorus bond because os oxygen phosphorus bonds are really favorable. But that would leave one of your uh, carbonyl carbon with a vacancy in its valence. So at the same time, the carbon that has the partial negative or the, the full negative in this resonance structure moves its extra lone pair over and fills that up. And so that's what gets us this four sided ring, um, which is called an oxophosphetane. Oxo oxophosphetane. It's short lived enough that it's one of those things that, okay, sure, it has a technical name, but Nobody cares because it doesn't stick around long enough. And then that immediately breaks apart. So, well, I made one oxygen phosphorus bond and that was stable. So let's do it again. Let's make another oxygen phosphorus bond. But we don't want to leave a carbon with an incomplete valence. So you break the carbon phosphorus bond in order to move those electrons over. So looking at these reactions, the, as soon as you recognize it's a Vivic reaction, you just have to say, okay, well, whatever is attached to my phosphorus in my Vivic reagent is just going to get, is just going to essentially replace the oxygen. So the net result. So making the Vitic reaction, the reagent is its own, its own special, special hell. Um, you start with the triphenyl phosphorus and just an alkyl halide. And then you have to, so when you expose it to that, you make a phosphonium salt, which you can actually store these. They're not very stable, but you can store these a little bit. They're an ionic compound. Um, they're going to be even less stable than a Grignard reagent, though. So, you know, less than a week, ideally. Don't let it get exposed to anything. Um, and then if you take that and expose it to um, butyl lithium, or a lot of times referred to as N-butyl lithium, N-butyl lithium gets used because that you have a carbon with an extra pair of electrons. It basically deprotonates, it's a very strong base, even stronger base than amide, than sodium amide. And so its use in this case is limited to, it's gonna steal a hydrogen from that, that phosphonium salts carbon. Um, so it deprotonates a carbon, tells you how strong of a base it is, because at least that carbon's attached to a phosphorus and carbon's um, able to be more electronegative than the phosphorus. And so then you just wind up with a carbon with a lone pair attached to a phosphorus, and that's relatively stable because you have this resonance structure where you wind up with a carbon phosphorus double bond as well. And the carbon phosphorus double bond is not super stable because you have a phosphorus is in a different role in the periodic table, right? So you have a mismatch in the size of the p orbitals. And so it'll make a pi bond, but it's not a very stable pi bond. So between that and the fact that carbon is slightly more electronegative than phosphorus, that's enough for carbon um, to have a net partial negative, which can then go in and be used um, to react with a carbonyl. So weird, different at least, more or less makes sense, even if I wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't have been able to probably draw this from scratch if I just said, predict the mechanism for this reaction. Nobody would have gotten this, right? Um, this is not where anybody's head would have gone. 
Um, but it sort of makes sense when you compare it to the pericyclic reactions, like the diels alder reaction. It's not all that different. Where it gets really painful is the stereochemistry. Because if you have a if you have an alkyl group as your vid attached to your vitate reagent, if you have an electron donating group on your vitate reagent, you get the Z product, which seems weird because we're making a something. Our final product here seems like that's the less sterically favored product. But if you look at the sterics of making that four-sided ring, putting these, these two things next to each other allows them to actually be avoiding sterics in the intermediate stage. So when we have an electron donating group attached, we get the Z as the major product. And with a high degree of stereoselectivity, it'll depend exactly on on how big these groups are that are attached. Um, but it'd be something on the order of like somewhere between 70 and 95% um, make, making the Z product. So if we think, if we go back here, if you think of these two hydrogens, if you replace one of them with an electron with a, a methyl group, then, and we need to actually be able to tell the difference over here as well, so make that an ethyl. Um, it's going to arrange itself so that those are trying to be in a staggered conformer. And that means that you wind up with the final product being the Z product. It's a little bit difficult to visualize, but it has to do with the geometry of this phosphorus up here, because that phosphorus has uh, coordination number of five, right? It has five different electron groups attached to it, which means it's trigonal bipyramidal, which means you've got 120 degree angles happening in here, plus they're, some of them are constrained because it's a four-sided ring, and those are forced to be 90 degrees from each other. Um, so when you put all of that together, the net result is that the sterics favor the Z if it's electron donating. But if it's electron withdrawing, this is where it starts looking like the Diels-Alder reaction. Remember that with the Diels-Alder reaction, if it was electron withdrawing, you got the exo. If it was electron donating, you got the endo product. I think I said that backwards. But regardless, the electron donating versus withdrawing made the sterics not be as significant. The sterics, um, wind up taking a back seat to being able to allow the pi bonds in your electron withdrawing group, they wind up stabilizing the, the um, carbon, the carbonyl pi bond that's breaking and the new bonds that are forming with the carbon, with the phosphorus and the oxygen. So remember they had that in, when we talked about that deals alder, we said that there was called them like secondary orbital interactions. Or basically pi bonds try to overlap with the other pi bonds, especially when you have a transition state happening, breaking those pi bonds. And so instead of making the Z, you make the E conformer when it's an electron withdrawing group. And you, you folks probably don't remember that necessarily, but I had to go to mastering organic chemistry to actually find a decent figure explaining that because most textbooks for the Beals Alder reaction just say, here's the way it is without going into detail about why. Um, it's even harder to find a decent video explaining stereochemistry of the Vidic reaction that doesn't just say electron donating Z, electron withdrawing E. Um, I did find one, and it also 
it also um, uses a similar select it. There, let's shift click, not control click. That's what it's going on. Um, um, he, and this guy's a guy from Georgia Tech, and he actually starts getting into the drawing these figures in a program very similar to Mac Multi LT um, as a way of, of explaining this. In 3D and showing these structures, what's happening. So the orange is your phosphorus, um, and the two R groups are the green ones. And so he, he gets a little bit into the orbitals, um, and or actually those are the electron donating, but then he talks about electron withdrawing and how that works further on. Um, so I recommend that. And then the other one was. I was going to show right as we're ending the big reaction stereo chemistry Google search I got there before I think it was a professor Dave maybe it was mastering organic chemistry um, there's one of them that actually had a video or a little gif of um, of people waltzing it was a an old old timey like dancing diagram. I can't remember where I found that one. If I find that, I'll send a link out later. But basically, it's tricky to wrap your head around. But if you can make it, at least see it make sense once in your head, then it might make it easier to remember, or at the very least, it'll help you remember that it's the electron donating versus withdrawing that really determines the stereochemistry of these vitic reactions. And we'll end there. We have only two slides left. Actually, these are just a practice slide that we we'll use next time and a summary slide. Um, so this gets us through the class two carbonyl chapter and making good time. So we'll do more practice. Don't forget to take a quiz this weekend.